All right. So all in the news lately, you guys can see that copyright is becoming like this major huge issue with AI, right? It's hitting uh, Hollywood. It's hitting books. It's hitting magazines. All kinds of great lawsuits are coming out. And uh, we've kind of bounced the topic around a little bit. And, and I'm curious what you guys think about some of this stuff. I mean, when you train a model, is it making a copy? I think that's the first thing we need to answer right there. Is it making a copy? That's a good question. I actually think that's a real foundational question. And technically, it's not. It's not. It's not making it. It's copy. not like a, a library where every book or every word ever written is just sitting there in a, you know, folder in a file. Oh, here's every book in order or whatever. That's not how language models work. So when a person reads a book, are they making a copy in their mind? I think that's a, a great point as well. And when I've been contemplating that if I read a book and I take the information from that book and I share with my team some lesson I learned from it, um, I probably am going to reference the book. If I go and give a speech and I use something from it and I say, hey, uh, this is you know, a great idea you learned from this book. But if I read a hundred books, now all of a sudden I'm synthesizing things. And I don't even remember where it came from. And nothing then is necessarily purely from one book. It's synthesizing all this knowledge and information from book to book to book. And there isn't a perfect copy in a human brain. If there is something specific, and you'll, you know, often on this podcast, even I'll talk about, oh, yeah, you can read this book or whatever to reference that, then, you know, it makes sense to say that. But if it's actually you learned something and you learned it from a series of things, then that doesn't feel like copyright or even copying or retaining a copy in my mind and that brings up another question chuck then there's a lot of people like mo gaudet you know he has his book scary smart um business officer at google and so on that basically not basically he says ai is humans he says treat them like your children yeah. um he's about the most scary and i think most out there and least logical of anybody in the space but he's like all over the podcast circuit everybody's talking to him um so you know it's easy to pick on him because he's just so fringe but you know that's what he believes and he believes that they're deserving of personhood because they learn and if that's the case how would you claim you know if we went to his extreme which again i don't agree with you know then it's a person and then it's just knowledge just like i can't say you copyright infringed on my book chuck because you read it and you remembered a few things from it Okay, so when they're definitely not alive, just because they have really good memory, they can pull things up, not alive, okay? We can go through the science on that if we want to turn the conversation into it, but as far as I'm concerned, not alive, not possible to become alive. Um, as far as the learning and making copies of things, I do think that there is an analogy to living things, to people. It doesn't mean they're the same thing, it just means it's an analogy. So like when you go into a classroom and the instructor gives you like three textbooks you're supposed to read and you read those textbooks and you go all through school and now you're getting your PhD and you're sitting down and you're writing your dissertation and everything and you're writing stuff that you've learned from these other books, you're not making a copy of it. You're just using the things you learned. And when we're looking at these AI language models, that's really what's happening. They're not making copies. So if I wrote a book with AI, if I gave that book to an AI and I said, uh, give me this chapter, this blah, blah, blah. It can look it up in a copy of that. But if I trained the model on that, what it does is it creates a series of embeddings. Those embeddings are not copies of the book. They are relationships between information that was contained within the book, just like our human brains do. They're, mm -hmm. It's a neural network. It's literally based off that. Exactly. So since there is no copy being made, there is no violation of copyright. And I feel very bad for some of the very unintelligent people in Hollywood who want to believe that there is a copy being made by these. I do not have any problem at all with language models being trained on copyrighted material as long as they have purchased one copy of it. So that was, I was going to say that, that, that if, it, if they purchase one copy, 
right? That to me seems like a potential solution that they just go buy one copy of every book or, you know, oh, I pay for my annual subscription to the New York Times or whatever, you know, so that you have access to the archives and so on. And that theoretically would cover it, I would think, based on just how they learn. But to be fair, I don't know what the law actually says, and I'm not a lawyer. So doesn't just because that's all logical and reasonable and that's how it works does not mean that's how the law is written. And so that's where I couldn't say, is it simple. legal or not? The copyright is actually a very simple thing. I mean, it's literally about making copies of things and whether or not you can distribute those copies of things. That's really what it is. It's well, I think it goes one step further than that, Chuck, right? It's whether you can make copies, distribute it, and make money from it. And that, I assume, is where people have the problem is because they see their livelihood disappearing, potentially, because this thing has learned from something else that they have done, which they hold on tightly to and believe is theirs and theirs alone, despite the fact that they distributed it. So yeah. I guess the question I would have is that OpenAI charges a subscription, as I'm sure a lot of these other AI models do. And if they don't now, they're definitely going to in the future. So if all of the LLMs are free and completely open source, would that change things, do you think? Do you, would these artists have a like to stand on? Hmm. No. I mean, you're right. It is all about money. That's what this all breaks down to. It's money and power. Because what, what really is money after a certain level, it no longer becomes the thing you buy a, you know, dinner with. It becomes power. That's, that's what money really becomes eventually is power. And that's what people want. People want power. Why shouldn't we want power? We don't want to be powerless. Who wants to be powerless? But at the same time, we have to recognize everybody else out there. And everybody else has a right to things. So I think of these authors or whoever's out there who's all freaked out about AI now has read my work and can now make good work. Do they also freak out about the students that are graduating that have read their work and are coming for their job? Because that's always happening. You're always going to lose out to whoever has the better knowledge and is coming up and, and, and going. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, Chuck. The analogy to the, to the person, or at least a neural network, you know, the brain, I think is still relevant. Right. Meaning I'm a professor and I'm getting paid to teach a bunch of kids based on all these books that I read. And I bought one copy of the book and I read the book and I learned the book and I know the information. And now I'm profiting from my knowledge and sharing it. So I think that's still a valid analogy to say this is how these things are working. The professor didn't memorize the book. And if you said, hey, where is that in the book? He's going to go look it up because he has his one copy of it. Yeah. <clears throat> but he's still profiting from it. Yeah, I think you can also think of this like um, you buy a recipe book, like a cookbook. Like we've got a few of them in the kitchen and we change them depending on season or whatever, um, and depending on who's cooking. <laughs> um, but you could you could literally take that and follow that to the letter, memorize it, and then create something. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're copying it. You're just using that knowledge. But if you copy that recipe rebrand it as your own and then sell it, then yeah, I can see how the, the, the original chef would have a problem with that. But you've still got to get through all the same hurdles that they've previously got through is to, to actually find distribution to who cares about your book. And yes, I think the LLMs might have that distribution because they've already got you know hundreds and hundreds of millions of users. But I think there's definitely an, an element of that that needs to sort of come into play. So like if an LLM reads a book and then just rebrands it and then whoever open AI sells that book as their own, then yes, I think that's an issue, but I don't necessarily see that what's happening right now is like you said, like you both said, it's copying. What might be interesting is looking at some of the open cases right now. And I don't know if you guys want to do this, but just give like a, an opinion of and none of us are lawyers. So this could completely go <laughs> whichever way we want it to go, but we could just look at it and say rubbish. They've got a point. I well, I'll give you an that. example of where we see this in action. <laughs> So, you know, talking about how the LLMs don't actually read. So when we were writing our book, so, you know, our Souls Intelligence book, I would go to the LLMs. Uh, in particular, I was using Gemini and Bard at the time a lot. And I would say, hey, give me a quote from Ray Kurz Kurzweil about this topic. Or, hey, show me a few quotes from Max Tegmark or you know, whoever the AI person that I was, you know, referencing. And I, and I knew because I'd read their material, roughly what they'd said. I just wanted the actual word for word quote, right? right. right? 
And so I had yeah, a list of them. And so I would it'd spit out some quotes and I'd be like, okay, that's the one I'm looking for. And I'd pull that quote and I'd put it in the book. And then when Greg was going through proofreading, he was like, hey, Brian, what's your source for this quote? And I'd be like, oh, it's from, you know, Kurzweil's book sitting there in there. He's like, I, I can't find it in the book. Do you know what page it's on? And I'm like, well, let me pull it up on my Kindle because I had a Kindle version of it. And you can search, you know, on your Kindle app. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that doesn't exist. What's going on here? And what would happen was the LLM would give me a, a series of quotes that really accurately portrayed their thoughts and their ideas. And they claimed it in quotes was a word for word statement, but it wasn't. So it was a brilliant summary. And that's why it fooled me of what they actually believe and what they you know write. It just wasn't a word for word summary. And so that I think is a good example of demonstrating how these LLMs work is that it's not referencing and looking up and going page in line unless you specifically ask it to, right? It's just, here's the knowledge it has about this person and I'm going to summarize, you know, what they said. Now, if you said, hey, I want to see, you know, find this, um, you know, we're doing some research on Peter Singer, the ethicist for animals, find me Peter Singer's, um, whatever it was, paper that he wrote. Okay, it found me the paper and it gave me a link and then I had to go read the paper. It wasn't like I could get it directly from the LLM as effectively as if I just went to the original source. So, you know, that's just a real world example of how these work. And it's not, it's like yeah. you said, Chuck, they don't have copies of them. I don't know, but uh, let, let me give you a, a, a funny world to think about. All right. You've got this, sil uh, what's her name? Uh, Sarah Silverman, the comedian actress. She's suing open AI because right. she leaves her stuff, you know, it was trained on her stuff. So let's picture a different world where, okay, open AI, they respect this now. All right, Sarah Silverman, we are going to remove everything about you. You have been removed. Okay, now tell me how that benefits Sarah Silverman because she's been removed. And as language models go forward, they will never mention her. Her work will never be referenced. Nothing she's ever done can ever be part of these language models. She is a non-person now. Is she happy? Is that what she wants? Well, let me think to that a little bit, Chuck, because that's a good question. I was thinking of it from a different angle, but that's a good one. Uh, would she still, like, would her Wikipedia listing still be allowed? Well, we should probably get rid of that. We should get rid of Because she didn't write that. That wasn't her works. No, but we don't want to infringe it on her. Does her IMDb listing get like that's where I'm a little bit unclear. It's not actually the language models will just have to not look at that. It will never be referenced. So as we go into these will this will this podcast get you know de indexed or whatever you want to say because we reference her? Oh no, it'll just remove all reference to her. Whenever we mention her name, Sarah Silverman, in the transcripts for the language model, it'll just blank that out. Well, I would assume there's levels to this. So like they might do that in spite. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which, which, which I don't <laughs> think is what she's asking for. No, but, but that's uh, where she's headed. Right. So I can see where they'd be like, okay, cool. We'll just like erase you from I'm thinking of like the sign, the, the scene from 300 that he's going to erase their tribe from the I, history. Like, just, <laughs> you know what I'm talking I, about? <laughs> um, so I can see that. And that I think would be um, not in her best interest, but I was thinking of it from another perspective. So I think, I think New York times had worked out a deal, if I recall correctly, with one of the, with open AI for their mm -hmm. content. But I'm thinking like, Hey, let's just say you took all the mainstream media and they were like, no, you can't steal our stuff. So ABC has gone. NBC has gone. You know, yeah. CBS is gone. Fox is gone. CNN is gone. So they just, nothing they've ever said None. is in the large language model. None of it. Now, now, one, there's a question of, is that better for us? Absolutely. <laughs> or Absolutely. not, right? It's so bad. Um, right and so, but the second is from a business perspective for them, you then have to make the case separately that, wait a sec, you have your open AI and you're going to ask about the news because eventually it's going to be real time before yeah. you aren't close to it. That's what their search GPT essentially is becoming. Um, and then instead, I'm going to go over to the separate source. I'm going to go subscribe to CNN and pay their money. I'm going to go subscribe to New York Times and get find their right. paywall. Like, am I going to go do all that? Or am I just going to say, oh, forget about those guys. I'm just going to use these tools. Now, the other side of it is, and this is a this is a challenge that I have to deal with with our company and with Pymage Searches. If it's trained on our knowledge, 
which almost certainly it is. I mean, it knows all about us if you ask questions and so on. Um, and it can answer questions. Organic traffic starts to drop. Organic traffic is how we get people on our email list. Organic traffic is how we get customers. So now it's like my incentive to write and generate content that's useful now becomes less because if they can just summarize information. Now, it's not as good. And this is where it gets a little bit interesting because if we ask it a question that's specific to an answer that we have, uh, and we'll just use a super generic, like it's a license plate reader. And so there's dozens of those yeah, out there true. in different formats, right? But let's just say we had superior code and it was more efficient and it was better and, and so on. Well, when you ask for that, it's just going to give you sort of whatever it's finding is most popular, however it defines that. And it's not clear. Is it weighting somebody else higher? Like oh. is OpenAI weighting the New York Times higher now as a news source than it is the New York Post? And so it's going to reference that first. And so is that happening across the board and how is that working? Or is it purely volume? Is it using signals like search engines do? How is it determining whose license plate reader code it's going to use? Or is it somehow, it can't really average them because then you're going to get jumbled. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to work when we're talking about code, right? So it's more different to what the internet, to what Google does now though, right? Well, it's different in that Google will give you a snippet but it's not going to give me the full details until I go through to the site. Well, Whereas, well, it, does, AI, it does weight different websites high, uh, more highly than others. That's why that's where domain authority comes from. And also Reddit as well. Like in the last, I don't know how many months, maybe 12, probably more. It weighs Reddit more than, than other sites as well. You're just talking, yeah. So you're talking about SEO in general. So not providing the information, but ranking the information. Exactly. Yeah. But you talked about ranking systems yes. there about the New York Times versus the New York Post. Like that, that's Perfect. not yeah. you, so right? Yeah. There's two steps there. One is how does it rank it? So that's the same as any search engine does some to some level. I would assume that has to happen to some degree with the LLM, right? Um, and, and two is, okay, now when it gives me an answer, so I ask it questions about legal, I ask it questions about health, I ask it questions about diets, I ask it questions about a million different things. Um, yes, so I was asking questions about viewership for, you know, marketing and so on. Um, it's pulling that information from somewhere. And when it would give me references, I would say link to this. The references that it gave me weren't exactly the same thing. Like it was clear that it was reading what it sent me, but it was also reading 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 other things to give me its actual answer. And so now it becomes is the quality of the average, and average isn't a great way of saying it, technically speaking, but is the, the quality of the overall, hey, I read all these bits of information I'm summarizing for you in AI, better than this particular answer, and, and code is the best example I have right now of this particular implementation of this challenging bit of code, is that better than if we looked at all of these of which most aren't any good, right? And that becomes your now, sales pitches, hey, wait a second. Yeah, you can go to the LM and get the okay stuff all blended together. Or you can come to us specifically and we'll give you the truth. We'll give you the best. We'll give you the most accurate. We'll give you the vetted. We'll give you so on. And I think there is an argument for that that's quite strong um, in a lot of ways because an LLM does not know what good marketing looks like. Right. And you've experienced this, Rob, in, in your work. And we ask it to, to come up with a sales letter. We ask it to come up with a, a landing page. We ask it to come up with marketing information or headlines or whatever, unless you give it very, very specific details. Hey, I want scarcity. I want urgency. I want a number. I want, you know, a guarantee. You know, I want proof. I want you know, like, you have to really get in there and tell it. Now, if you tell it all these things, it's, it's amazing. But you just took your knowledge of making you, a, you know, why you're a great marketer put it into the LM and said, okay, I want you within these constraints, then give me quality. Now, if you're an average or not a marketer at all, it's going to spit out something. And you're going to be like, oh, that's pretty cool. That, that sounds good. But it's just because your gap of knowledge is, oh, I think this, you know, five on a scale of 10 is good marketing because I don't know any better. And that's essentially where the LMs are. They don't know any better. So they're giving you the five stuff. They can't really give you the 10 stuff because they don't know it. They don't know what makes something a 10 because it's the internet. It's the, hey, Carrot juice is going to cure cancer and ginger root is going to cure cancer and chemo is your it's only so option. There's nothing else that's going to work. And you better cut it out and then you better radiate it. And like, there's all this stuff out there and it doesn't know unless you give it guidance. And, and, and that's where there is, I think, an argument for, again, curated quality content. So I'm the plug for Pymet search here. <laughs>
<laughs> that you know is high quality, that's vetted by world-class experts instead of just what's the average, yeah. right? And again, average isn't the technically right word, but I think you get my point. Does that make sense? Because I would, I want to switch topics if, if we're wrap that one up. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with that. Do you want to, uh, should we stop this and then? <clears throat> no, no, this is within the same copyright topic. It's just, I want to adjust it just a little bit. So this is something that we talk about. Okay, LLMs are brilliant. They're intelligent. They're amazing. They're going to lead us. Well, most people don't think they're going to lead us to AGI, that it's going to be some sort of multimodal or whatever, that at least the people are arguing on that. Um, I know, I, I agree, Chuck, but this is what's being said. Um, <laughs> I find it very interesting when you think of how the LLMs and, and the neural networks, the artificial neural networks that we create work versus how the human brain works, right? For a LLM to give me anything even remotely useful, it has to be trained on terabytes and terabytes of information, right? I don't even know how many hundreds or thousands or millions so much information before it's even available to be something that's remotely helpful. I mean, I can think to back to when we were using GPT-1, which was still tons of data, but was was kind of messy and clunky. And like at the time you were like, well, this is pretty cool because it was just new. And it was like, okay, we've never seen anything like this before. But then I think of my youngest is about to turn one in a week and a half. And like his ability to process language and now start say words and try and replicate them and stuff. He doesn't need to read a million or 10 million books to start learning and recognizing. Like he can say ball. He knows what a ball is. I didn't have to show him 37,000 different balls <laughs> to get him to know what a ball was. Right. You don't have to show him like if we see animals out back, some some bunny rabbits or something like that. He doesn't need to see. 150 different types of bunny rabbits in different scenarios to know what a bunny rabbit looks like. Like you just see it once and he knows that's a turtle or, or whatever. Right. And the way that the human mind works, it's now that we can compare it to LLMs, it's almost like all of this information has some base level of training set. Right. So if I took a pre-trained model and then added my own data, it's like RAG, for instance. So SRAG is where I can just upload my PDF of information and say only reference this. But it's based on a pre-trained model. It's as if we all have a pre-trained model. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right with you on that. Yes. Do you, does uh, does that track with you, Rob, as a non-AI? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm careful not to say too much here before I get dragged into something I have no idea about, but all of that made sense. We're just going to talk about blob, uh, fractal globules. Uh, nothing ah, bigger you should have said. <laughs> no, no. It involves fractal antennas, a simple concept. So, all right, so then we have to take it one step further. If we all have an embedded pre-trained model, mm -hmm. where is that pre-trained model? Where is that information stored? And you can go back to the beginning of life at conception and say, I don't think it's in there. Like there's just physically isn't enough data storage in that physical you know, um, sperm and egg for you to say that amount of information, that much of data could be stored in something physically that small, even at a, you know, when we start looking at um, atomic data structures and storage and all that sort of thing. So is it possible that this becomes another feather in the cap of suggesting, hey, there's a soul, soul being the source of our rational intelligence. And that so that rational intelligence actually is kind of just a pre-trained model. And what we feed it and what we train it on, meaning our life experiences, what our parents do, what books we read, whatever else, is what comes out the other end of our neural network. And I literally just came up with that on the fly. I hadn't really thought that much through it. <laughs> uh... Is You'd say that AI with the, has the one difference, and that it, it it shouldn't forget, right? Whereas as we get older, you know, our brains might degenerate, or you know, like get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or uh, some other brain generative disease, degenerative disease, where you forget things, whether that happened today or five years ago. So, so AI of, would be so an advantage. Some really, there's some really interesting things that we're noticing with LLM. So let's say we have a context window. Now let's say the context window is, let's just make up a number, it's a thousand tokens, right? And so let's say I feed it something that's 5,000 tokens. 
what we were finding is, and Chuck, you can confirm this because I think you're familiar with this research, is it'll remember like the first 500 and the last 500, which is similar to how humans, if I gave you a random set of words or numbers, right, and it was 20 long, you're going to remember the first few and you're the last few, and you're not going to remember much of what's in the middle, which gets kind of interesting. Like, why did the LLM follow that same pattern it's of so only weird. remembering the edges like humans do? And I think there is some physical structure to the neural network of our brains and of what we're replicating, you know, artificially that, that I don't know that we understand it. I'm not saying there's a simple explanation for it, but there's some level of uh, congruency there that they're similar in that regard. I think the hallucinations is also another factor. I'm sure you've seen the things where like literally they'll have somebody witness a crime and they'll have like a group of people, 20 people, 30 people, whatever, witness a crime. And they'll all ask them different questions and they'll do two different things, which are interesting. One is they'll let one person speak and let everybody hear it. And they'll make that person the Confederate. So that person's going to say, oh, the person that was wearing a black trench coat was wearing a, a white, fluffy, you know, whatever coat. And like a large percentage of the people will agree with them. Right. So you have that, OK, the bias of, well, somebody else said it. I'm not entirely sure or whatever. But then they'll also just say, OK, we'll ask everybody separately and you will get. Okay, that black trench coat was red and that one was, and that person was tall and that person was short and that, like, there's all these different things. And so there is, that to me sounds kind of like hallucinations. It's exactly what it is, man. It's the same thing. So I, I don't know if it's the same thing. And of course, you can more, more easily add data storage. So let's call it our random access memory or, or whatever, like your short term memory. It's, it's possible for us to improve all these things as humans, of course, but with a machine, there is, you know, you can keep adding on and adding on and adding on uh, to some degree. And so I do think, Rob, it is absolutely fair. I have never argued that they're not more intelligent than us. I think if your basic understanding of intelligence is, is that, oh, it has a better memory. Sure, absolutely. Is it able to connect more dots because it's read more? Absolutely. I think it is more intelligent than us. Intelligence is just not the defining factor of what makes a person a person. That's so interesting then. So essentially, AI functions in the same way as a human brain. And it even has similar memory patterns or recall patterns. And it recalls the first 500 words and the last 500 words, but not the middle 3000 or whatever. But what you said earlier about um, a human, once it's learned that a bunny rabbit is a bunny rabbit, it doesn't need to keep learning the different variations of a bunny rabbit or a cat. Yeah. It can just understand that a cat is a cat, depending, okay. you know, regardless of how it looks. It can't understand anything because we're just, for the most part here, we're just talking about language models. We could talk about uh, vision models, but these mm. are all different things. So a person or a human being we're not just like a language model. I mean, there's similarities there, but everything we think and do is affected by all of our other senses that, that we have coming into us, whether it's uh, the sense of pressure or the sense of how warm it is or cold or how our tummy feels or whether we have a headache. We have all these other senses that are all being integrated into our thoughts as we go. Language models don't have any of that. They only have language. Vision models only have vision. The closest we get to this kind of stuff are the multimodal models, but all those really are are model are different models working together. Even runways, uh, general world models, all those really are are a bunch of other little models that are all working together. Our brains kind of do that, but we have a lot of models going on. I had COVID and I lost my sense of smell, and it made me think a lot about what is smell. You know, I. It took a while. I read some articles, found out that it's been linked to damage in the brain that's associated with spatial reasoning. Spatial reasoning. And it dawns on me that scent, that's what scent is. Scent tells you what something, where something was at a specific time. It's an indicator of a spatial thing. Language models don't have anything like that. They don't have any concept of the world around us. They have no concept of time. They have no concept of space. I think that's a, that's a great summary, Chuck. And have you read the book? Are you familiar with the work by Jeff Hawkins called A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence? No. It's, it's actually a very similar concept to what you're saying. 
is that essentially the brain forms a thousand subbrains within it for all the different things. Nuances is the right word, but the experiences from different angles, right? So there's a, you, know, you said it lacks understanding. That's the whole discussion of perception versus experience. My thermostat can perceive temperature, just can't experience it, right? right? There's, there's a difference there. And so the thousand brains, which... So let's follow your theory out and even take, so Jeff Hawkins is an, is an atheist, take his theory of, okay, these thousand brains. And so if we think of them as one as a, a visual pre-trained model and one's an auditory pre-trained model and one's a, a, you know, all the senses plus all the experiences, plus all the emotions, those all have pre-trained models. And now we say, okay, it seems like we have all of those embedded into us, even as infants, right? And of course there's people that have disabilities, but we're just going to say, right. we're going to ignore this for now just to simplify the discussion. There isn't physically enough storage without a sperm and an egg for all that to be in there. Yeah. Like, so where is that data? Where is that data set, that training, the pre-trained model? Um, like it, this is why, you know, the, the subtitle of our book is how AI proves we, we need God. Like there's just so much when you get into what AI can do, but what it can't do that now gets back to, wow, philosophy has really kind of addressed this 700, 800, 1,000 years ago. And the AI is just helping make it really clear it's making it more obvious to us than ever before so we're wrapping up there i feel like we should yeah that was a perfect ending